Uh, welcome to College of DuPage. My name is Joe Collins. I'm the Executive Vice President here, and it's a great honor on behalf of the College of DuPage and the Middle East Committee uh, to welcome our honored guest here tonight. Um, Dr. Osama Ibrahim is a man who is most recently elected the President of University of Alexandria, the first person uh, to be elected to a public uh, university in Egypt. Um, this is the only university in an Arab country and the second in Africa to achieve a status in the Times Higher Education Worldwide University Ranking as one of the top 200 universities worldwide. Congratulations on that great honor, Dr. Ibrahim. In addition, for the second time in 2011, Alexandria University has received a position on the prestigious QS World University Ranking from approximately 17,000 universities around the world. A professor of ophthalmology at Alexandria University, Dr. Ibrahim has promoted refractive surgery all over the Arab world and Middle East, and has helped to establish many centers by educating, training, and supervising colleagues from around the world. He is the CEO of the chain Roya, which has expanded to include six centers in Egypt and two in the Arab world. In addition, Dr. Ibrahim was recently selected to serve on an elite commission to draft Egypt's new constitution. And I'm very interested in hearing his comments tonight on that fascinating process. I have to turn my page now for my cheat sheet. Tonight, Dr. Ibrahim will discuss how he was elected president of a state school in Egypt, what his vision of the future is for the University of Alexandria, his wish of collaborating with foreign institutions, I hope College of DuPage is on a list of institutions you would like to collaborate with. I think it would be appropriate, especially considering the fact that one of our faculty recently received a Fulbright uh, Award to travel to Egypt to pursue research activity there. And Dr. Ibrahim also will discuss his participation in the drafting of the new constitution of Egypt. After Dr. Ibrahim's comments, a question and answer period will follow. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to the president of University of Alexandria, Dr. Ibrahim. I'm really honored to be here with you. And I know you're eager to know about Egypt and I'm eager actually to meet people here from the community in the States, and I know uh, this gathering, uh, it's not a formal gathering. I'm not here to lecture you or speak about something. I, it's a very informal, so please feel free to ask any question, and uh, hopefully we can uh, exchange ideas. First, uh, I was graduated from the uh, Alexandria University. I had all my degrees from there my master degree, my doctorate degree. And I, I was fortunate to come to the States here for two years for a fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Actually, my, my fellowship here changed my life. Changed my life because I found in the States a system that was lacking in Egypt, especially at the time between 88 and 90. When I came back, like anybody who's uh, been sent by the government or the university to complete his study abroad. I was so frustrated. I was deeply involved in research in, in Atlanta and I thought once I come back, everybody will embrace me, everybody will help me, I can share my knowledge with everybody and unfortunately nothing happened. Why is that? One of the main reasons actually is that in Egypt, during the last 30 years, those who were governing the country were not interested at all in the benefit of people. We know that uh, education is the cornerstone for any development. And unfortunately, education was left behind. The uh, budget that was allocated for education was so little that everybody was trying to, to do his own uh, Agenda. I mean, to, for, for, when I was frustrated, I, I thought a lot. What shall I do? Shall I come back to where I was doing my fellowship? Actually, I was granted a job there with a, a promise of getting the visa and all the facilities. 
but I refused. My wife and I actually were, when we got married, we pledged each other that we will stay in Egypt, that we will help Egypt to become the country that we always dream about. The only solution for me at that time was to have my own solution. So I, that's why I started my private practice, which was unique in the fact that it was mainly dedicated for training young doctors. Those, the things that I was unable to do in the university, we were able to do it in the private sector. We had our own research, we had our own training, using my connections, and I kept my connections actually very strong with the uh, community abroad, whether in, in the States or in, the, in Europe, a, a member of all the, the organizations, and I've been a founding member in many of them, and I used this not to have a, a personal glory, actually. I used this mainly to help my young uh, students to get connected and get acquainted with the system abroad. And fortunately, we have a very strong team that expands not only in Egypt, actually, but all over the Arab countries and the Middle East. I was fortunate to be one of the first people who started what we call refractive surgery. Refractive surgery was a dream. Everybody thought it's impossible to be applied, but with God's help and with perseverance and hard work, we, we were almost ahead of all the uh, countries in this particular subspecialty. What about politics? To be honest, throughout this life, I was totally away from practicing politics. Of course, we, we, we had something we call like the couch, couch party which means that we were sitting, watching the news, criticizing, and doing nothing. Why, why we were not doing? Because it, we were ho almost hopeless. Whatever you do, I mean, even I didn't participate in any of the elections that happened in the last 30 years, because we had a strong belief that the, the election is already predetermined and there's uh, no hope and there's no any significance of going and spending or losing time. So I was really devoted to my career, devoted to my teaching, and I had no administrative job whatsoever. But on the other hand, I tried to, to establish a system for these private institutions and private centers that I use. So my experience in, in the management was applied, but was applied on the private sector. Then came the revolution. With the revolution, actually, we had no excuse. I mean, in the past, we were uh, afraid. Uh, we, we, we were not, uh, we didn't have any hope, to be honest. We were facing a wall that we never thought that this wall can be broken. Actually, we lost confidence in our, uh, in our young people. We thought that the generation of 30 years, those people, or these young people, they never practiced any democracy. They never felt the, the freedom. They never participated or joined in any political. On the contrary, even practicing policy, I mean politics, in the university or in schools were, was abandoned, was not Right, that mean they said university is only for education. If you want to practice politics, you practice it outside, which means you don't practice it. We lost faith in these young people. But in, with the revolution, it, it proved to all of us that we were wrong. This young generation actually were not uh, unaware of the, what's going on. On the contrary, they were so involved in what's going on. They were so frustrated that they were not involved in taking decisions that affect their future, that affect their life. And they proved to us in January 25th going on that we were wrong and they were right and they were able to do what we were, uh, what we thought that will never happen. And ever since, I thought that 
my life has to change. I, instead of being so passive, and instead of being so self-centric, or even, even if I have a larger circle, but this circle was not enough. My university helped me a lot, and if it was not for the university, I, was, I will be unable to come to the States to have a fellowship. I will be unable to continue my international connections. Or, Of course, I, I used to go to the university, teach my students, and, and that was it. I felt that it's now my obligation to pay back the university that helped me to be what I was. I mean, uh, then I decided when uh, there were some demonstrations actually against the previous administration and the, they all wanted actually to, to, to have a saying in choosing whoever runs the university. And for the first time, for years and years, the president of the university was, be, was appointed by the president of the country. And I always believe that whoever appoints you, you will be loyal to him. So if you are appointed by a higher authority, then you will be obliged to do whatever they tell you or whatever they think or whatever they believe. Or, and that's why all our life was under the directions of our uh, president. And, and the president doesn't only mean the president of the, uh, of the country, the president of anything. The prime minister was the guide for all the ministers. The ministers were the guides for all the people underneath. So it was a, a very, let's say, individualized system with no appropriate way of thinking. And this, we, we thought that it has to be changed. Then after the revolution, we, we thought that every position should be by election. For the first time, we hear the word election. We hear the word it's my duty to choose whoever decides for me. And it started actually from the, uh, in the university, it's divided into departments where all the professors uh, share and work. And uh, it's the department, the, the department is the strongest unit in the university because it's, it's the one that decides the policy, that decides the subjects, that decides the program, that takes approval. And usually the head of the department was chosen by the dean of the, of the faculty. And always the dean will choose somebody who will be an easy going with him. He will not disobey him. He will be uh, friendly with him. Sometimes he's one of his friends or relatives. And this was the way the whole country was done. And for the first time, we had a chance to change this. We shared in this election. We elected our own head of the department, and then we shared in electing the dean of the university, of the whole faculty. Up, till, up to this moment, I never thought of proposing myself or even proposing that the idea that I should be uh, elected or run for the presidency. All, all my, my thoughts at that time was to serve the university as a humble professor that will do his job, but in a different atmosphere. Will do what, whatever I was doing in the private sector. It's now a chance for me to apply it where it should be applied in the university. And instead of serving a small group of my own uh, fellows and my own students, I will serve the whole faculty. Then we were celebrating actually with the dean of the faculty who happened to be an ophthalmologist like myself. We were sitting and we proposed to him and we said, you should run for the president of the university. And then he raised his head and said, no. Having the head of the university needs somebody like Osama Ibrahim. And I, for the first time, why, why did he say that? I think throughout my life, I've been a cosmopolitan person. I, I, open you know, my travels, my connections to different uh, ethnic groups and different uh, uh, people, different countries. I travel a lot. I, I tend to accept others. My, my, my opinion is right, but it has a good chance to be wrong. And others may be wrong, but definitely they can be 
Right, so this is the way that I was dealing with everybody. And at this moment, I, I thought it's now a, a mission. A mission that I was almost chosen to do this, and I found that it, this is the time where I can apply my own vision and my own strategy, and I worked hard. As I mentioned, I didn't have any administrative uh, jobs before, so I was not aware of the Egyptian laws of, that governs the, the routine of the university. So I decided, you know, the, the election was about one, one and a half months, six weeks. This decision, I took this decision six weeks before the expected date of the, running the election. So for six weeks, I studied as I have never studied in my life. My son can tell you I had three books uh, about all the laws, all the regulations, all the administrative uh, jobs. And moreover, I started to think, how can I apply the same strategy that we use for a successful private practice? Why don't we apply this in the university? And I made my vision and I plan according to these concepts. My vision was very simple. First, you know, the university is based on three pillars. The students, these are our product. We are here to teach these students and make them an employable product, product that can find a job and that can help the country. We have the, the staff the professors and assistant professors and young uh, staff who are struggling to, 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 to find a decent living, who are struggling to find the research, no, the, the, no funds for the research at all. It will be ridiculous to know that the, the fund allocated for the ophthalmology department was less than 50 US dollars per month. So everybody was paying for his own research. How can we bring these people together, make them uh, believe in their own university, regain the trust, regain the confidence? A, a professor everywhere is looked upon as the highest rank in the society, the most respectable, the highest brain they can solve. In Egypt, unfortunately, uh, the picture was turned down. The, the, the professors were getting the lowest salary compared to, for example, the uh, police officers or the, the judges and those who are working in this field. So we, for years before the revolution and in the early period of uh, Abdel Nasser, the professors were special, special. They have a special category as regards the wages and the, the dealing with them. But the idea that our late President Nasser actually was trying to, to enforce equality, but in a wrong way. Equality doesn't mean equality in, in, in payment. It means equality in having rights, equality in practicing uh, the rights, but not in having the same wages the professor liked, uh, for example, uh, a worker or an employee or something. So my main mission towards my dear colleagues first is to regain their confidence, their belonging to the university and to the country, to make them feel that they are part of the project, a project that will bring our university to the level that it really deserves. And the, th the third pillar are the employees. Our university are stacked with employees that are really doing nothing because simply the system does not exist. We don't have a, a system that utilizes the efforts of everybody in his own uh, uh, right place. Corruption made choosing the, the, the employees based on uh, being a relative or a friend or a son or of another employee. So, the, 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 the system itself, the, the employees, we need to reorganize the whole system. 
For those of you who don't know, in Alexandria University, we have almost 170,000 students in the different disciplines. I have some pamphlet for you that contains, if, if everybody, anybody is interested, he can have a copy that will tell you about more details about Alexandria University. We have about 8,000 staff members distributed, whether professors and down to the uh, lecturers and assistant lecturers and uh, demonstrators. And we have 35,000 employees. So it was, it's not even a pyramid that's upside down. It was a, an unknown shape with no uh, structure. My vision is to work with these three pillars and try to utilize the best of each force and to coordinate and cooperate to make Alexandria University an international university. To be an international university, you have to change, you have to change the curriculum so that they have to be up to date, they have to be recognized. We have to change the system. You know, having, we, we used to have a struggle with the old administration about having the credit hour system versus the Bologna system, a system that you can measure. You can measure. Everything's fine? That's okay. That's okay. I can manage. Uh, we, we wanted, if, if you want to be a global or an international university, you have to have something to compare with other universities. If my dream is to have a joint degree with another university, this joint degree has to be accredited from both sides. So we have to change our curriculum to be up to date and to help our graduate students to be employable. In Egypt, actually, for years and years, the university education is free. And the society looks upon the university grad as this is the, the, where everybody should be. And they, unfortunately, they look at the workers as a downgraded. It's not the, I mean, whoever uh, goes to the market and starts working before getting his degree, there is something wrong. Either his family cannot support him or uh, the, the, there's something wrong in his character. He cannot cope with the uh, education system that we have. And this was a major problem, a major problem that resulted in a big cluster of university grads that are unfortunately not suitable for the market. They are unemployed and they have to come back and work for jobs that doesn't need a university degree. We have a lack of, for example, technicians. We have a lack of certain jobs that the society needs a plumber, or a good electrician, or an, uh, an assistant, or a nurse assistant, or somebody who works in a, in a small lab or in a small factory. This is, my main vision is to try to dissolve this cluster of unemployed graduates into two things. First, we try to convince those people to go into the working market as early as possible, especially if they, if they need it, if the family they need it. So in Egypt, we have uh, the education system. We have a six year and then three years. And then after these nine years, we have a division. Either they go to the secondary school that will bring them into the university, or they go to a technical uh, school. And this technical school, unfortunately, doesn't produce a skilled worker. And the graduates of this are also looking to join their uh, colleagues and also go to a higher education. So the first thing that I did is, is to, to make something called uh, an elect it's not a, a technological university. We wanted to give it an attractive name. This technological university actually will take care of this technical, uh, it's something like the community colleges that you have here in the States. It, it, its main objective is to try to convince these young chaps to go into the working environment as early as possible to support themselves, to support their families, 
and at the same time putting in mind that the ambition they have or the comparison or at least the society look to them will not change in, in, in a day or two. It will take a long time for the society to acknowledge these people and to give them the, to, to look upon them as uh, real human beings that have their own rights. They are not different. On the contrary, they might be even better than those uh, who wait five more years to become uh, unemployed. So we will give them a chance. We call this system three plus two plus two. Three years, this means the three years that they spent in their technical school, which is comparable to the secondary school. And we will bring those, either the secondary school grads or the technical, groups, uh, the technical school uh, grads, and we'll give them one year of skill transfer. We made uh, agreements with the industry people that they will support these people during this year of, we'll call it a skill transfer. We will transfer, transfer them into uh, a skilled worker that the, can find a job, whether in the industry or the, even in the community. Then they, we, we, we will allow them to go to, the, to work, and then at any time, one year, two years, five years, when he's satisfied, when his needs are okay, and if he wants to rejoin, he can have a, a, a two year of a higher diploma that will make him a more skilled and more specialized technician. Then, if he has the, the, the will or he has the facility or the, 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 he wants to, to be ranked in the society, or if he wants, we'll give him another, a possibility of another two years of higher education. So he can get, at the end, a degree that's comparable to his uh, uh, classmate who continued uh, in the university, but instead of waiting for these five years, he joined the working power. This will help the society a lot. We, we know that education is essential, but the main aim of education is, is not to have uh, uh, you know, an intellectual people that don't work. The country needs all subspecialties. They need skilled electricians, skilled plumbers, skilled uh, everybody. And uh, each job is as respected as others. I mean, uh, a physician is not better than a plumber. They are both humans. They, are, they both can be well-educated. They can be uh, very active in their society. So parallel to this program, we will have a, a social problem, a social program that will try to take away the effect of the old media, old movies that represent those classes as a lower class, as a, uh, you know, you look upon them as if they are uh, not uh, humans or not uh, comparable to others. So we need social, we need this concept. On the other hand, what about the genius students? How can we discover these genius students? We need, besides the, the workers, we need also intellectual people that will lead the society. We don't have a mechanism to produce these highly intellectual people, genius, inventors. So going hand in hand with this uh, philosophy is to have what we call centers of excellence. The centers of excellence in Egypt, or in Alexandria University, we have faculties, faculty of medicine, faculty of science, faculty of agriculture. We have many interdisciplinary confusion among these faculties. For example, we have a, 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 a biochemistry department in the Faculty of Medicine, Faculty of uh, uh, Science, and in five or different faculties. And they don't work together. Everybody is working like an isolated island, having his own life, and they don't share anything. They don't work in teamwork. They lack the idea of sharing and giving and getting the information. And so my second plan, we already started this, is to have centers of excellence dedicated for uh, interdisciplinary system. For example, we have centers of excellence for nanotechnology. We have a nanotechnology cluster where physicians can work, pharmacists can work, faculty of science, faculty of engineering. We will we, all have these uh, clusters. We'll have them like science parks 
And within these science parks, we'll have incubators. The idea of having these incubators is to detect genius. Not, we don't have to be genius graduates, but we can start even from an undergraduate level. Everybody who has an idea or a project or an invention or uh, even uh, have some uh, uh, outstanding ability in anything can join these clusters and join these incubators. And as the name implies, we'll incubate these talents, we'll provide them with the environment that they will need, and they will work hand in hand with the industry. If the industry has a problem, we'll, we'll uh, spread the word about we have this problem. For example, I uh, suggested that we'll have only three objectives. One of them is treating hepatitis, for example. Hepatitis became so endemic in Egypt. It's a problem. It's a major problem. And I believe that everybody, all the research that's funded, especially by the government, who has limited budget, should be directed to something that will help the community. So we'll dedicate some of these uh, efforts to treat one of the project or the problems that face the whole community, like hepatitis. In Alexandria, for example, we have the sea. The sea is encroaching over the land. It's a major problem. We have a problem of water. So we have a problem with energy. So actually, we, we, this will be focusing upon. We'll be focusing upon the renewable energy and water, de, water desalination. And on the other hand, in the medical field, we'll focus on hepatitis. All the research should go there, all the support. Of course, if anybody has another idea, he's, he's willing to do it. But he has to find his own support. If he finds his own support in his own idea, well and good. But the limited budget will be directed to one, two, or three, maximum five big ideas, big projects that will help the whole society. What about the, my personal experience? What happens is that there is always a brain drain. All our young graduates who are so enthusiastic, who goes abroad, anywhere, whether in the States or Europe or anywhere, when they find the right atmosphere, they refuse to come. They stay there. And by staying there, they create two problems, actually. Problem for us, because these are the good people that should build our country, and we lose them. They are drained. And on the other hand, they create a problem to the society, where they, because sometimes they are not accepted as foreigners, different religions, different habits, and the, the, the other people refuse to continue the mutual cooperation. So our main focus in the research part will be what we call a joint degree or a dual degree. What I mean by a dual degree is that if, if uh, somebody is supposed to spend five years to get a doctorate degree, for example, he will spend the first two years in his own community, studying the problem that the community has, getting acquainted with the, uh, the, the needs of the society. And during these two years, we'll have a mobility program that will bring professors, staff from both sides together to give them the lectures that he needs. Then the second two years, he will move to the other environment. And the environment, what we discovered is that most of the grants and research projects are dedicated to help the other party, the other university. Each university has its own projects, its own plans, and it's directed to this target. No. We want actually to create a research project that will help us. It's not, uh, I mean, uh, how would Egypt benefit from five years study in a minute problem that we don't have, we don't face, a problem that does not exist in Egypt. So the, the research project and the, uh, the activity should be directed to a problem that helps our country. He will spend two years, whether in a lab or in a, uh, research center or anything. And during these two years, our staff will also be mobile. The, the, the staff members will go there. They will have experience. And when they come back, they will create the same environment that he's working on. If he's working in a, a nano lab, we will transfer this nano lab to our country. So by the end of the fifth year, he will come back and then he will spend the last year working in the same environment, so there's no excuse for him that job satisfaction is no there. 
will provide him with job satisfaction, and we will ask him to transfer his knowledge to his colleagues. So the last year will be actually an interdisciplinary system. And at the end of the five years, he will get a, program, a degree that's accredited from both universities, from both sides. And even he may get two degrees if the system in the two universities is not uh, exactly the same. He may add a thesis to get a degree, or he may add another research or some more credit hours. So as regards the research, we are focused on this joint program. And we are lucky. I was in England about a month ago in, a, in a, you know, something called going global. Really, the, world, the whole world is going global. It's becoming a small village. For the first time, you know, England has always been a very conservative country. And always, they, they, whether professors or students, they go to England to learn, and they come back. For the first time, I hear the British uh, professors speaking about sending not only students of their own to learn different experience from abroad, but also professors. The, they criticize their own professors that they are living in a closed community and that with the world globalization and internationalization, they have to move and they have to get experience for the other words. So, the, the, we are lucky now because everybody in the world is moving towards this direction of ours. And everybody, it became now a prerequisite and a requirement of many universities actually to have some international uh, affiliation and international uh, cooperation with some. So w w just having, a, a meeting with this university presidents and this unique opportunity in England, we discovered that Alexandria University with its old history Alexandria University, by the way, is one of the oldest universities. It dates back to more than 2,000 years. How is that? Because the bibliotheque, the Alexandria Bibliotheque, a famous bibliotheque, started more than 2,000 years ago, not as a library. It started actually as a university. And it started, strangely enough, as a community college. It, it started to teach people, teach the society, and uh, it was so integrated with the society at that time. So we, the, the whole world is going back as an international village again. So during the last four months, we managed actually to make very strong correlation with the top-notch students, whether uh, universities, whether in, in Europe and fortunately here in the States as well. We started with England. We had... Uh, an agreement, agreement, not only an MOU with the Southampton University. In Alexandria University has a unique experience in maritime and in marine uh, uh, sciences. So we had a, an agreement with uh, Southampton, who happened also to be one of the leading universities in this respect. And we expanded this to include the whole universities. We had a meeting with Hull University. I visited Cardiff. Cardiff Metropolitan. We had a tripartite with agreement with Cardiff Metropolitan and the Arab Academy so that the three universities will work together in fields that we need. Fields like sports medicine, like health sciences, like business. We already have a system with them to give an executive MBA. We also we were very interested in education. It, Egypt and Alexandria can give a lot in teaching Arabic language for those who are interested, Islamic culture, history, and also Sharia laws. The faculty of, of, of laws in Egypt is one of the strongest faculties. We have strong ties with France and England. We have a French uh, system and we have an, an English system included in the studies. We also have a unique opportunity for diplomats. I had a meeting with most of the ambassadors in Egypt. We are planning to establish a diplomatic, I wouldn't call it college, but at least a diplomatic program that's open for all countries. Those who are being prepared to work in Arab or in Islamic countries, they always lack the, the personal experience of living. So instead of sending an ambassador of, of 
for example, of the states to Pakistan to start his own experience. They come to Egypt, they li live in a society that's cosmopolitan, that's acceptable. Alexandria, by the way, has always been a cosmopolitan city. We have strong ties with Europe, across the Mediterranean Sea. Many people from Italy, from Greece, they live in Alexandria. They, they are considered Alexandrians. And they are treated as normal person, as patriots. And uh, we, we don't have this problem of treating tourists or treating foreigners in a different way. So this is a golden chance. We also have uh, agreements with Palermo University in Italy. We visited, I was invited by the, what we call the curriculum of university presidents, the beginning of, uh, of April, actually, three or four weeks ago. Uh, it's a consortium by uh, Princeton, Columbia, New York, Yale, and I think the fifth one is Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken, that they alternate every year. This year, we were invited by Columbia University, and we were invited as a representative of the Middle East, together with the University of Qatar and University of Jordan, we, uh, to, to discuss one of the major problems that faces the world now, which is the youth bulge. And uh, the Secretary General, Mr. Pankimoon, was there. He was the guest speaker, and we sat together. We had dinner together, and we spoke about how can the university face and use the youth bulge as an asset rather than a liability. It's, it, it, I mean, we have so many potentials, and instead of facing these potentials like a Tsumu uh, wrestler, we can use it as an Aikido. We use the potential of the others to the benefit and to our benefit. So we had such an interesting meeting. We made great connections with different university leaders here in the States. We went to Johns Hopkins University. We had an agreement there with the uh, university, with the Johns Hopkins. They have a unique institute that actually will help me to speak about the next topic, which is the Constitution. We had an agreement about the human rights and the human trafficking to help them. And they have uh, great, actually, ideas about how can we incorporate in our Constitution the uh, items that will help us to encourage the human rights and preserve them and to uh, prevent the human trafficking in our uh, region. Then I moved to uh, Johns Hopkins uh, medical part, which is one of my uh, favorite universities, actually, and institutions. We will have a strong cooperation. We both discovered that we both have a branch in Malaysia. So we, st we agreed that the branch in Malaysia will be a blend of the system that we acquire, which is a, a six-year program, together with the American system that has a pre-med and a four-year program. And they were facing problems in Malaysia. Uh, Alexandria, by the way, is hosting 1,000 Malaysian students that we teach uh, medicine. And we were required by the king of Malaysia to open two branches there, one in an area called Sabah area and one in Kuala Lumpur itself. The Kuala Lumpur will be medicine. So they were very excited to cooperate with us in this medical school branch of Johns Hopkins in uh, Kuala Lumpur. We also visited Maryland uh, University where we have a program called the uh, flagship program, which joins five universities here in the States with Alexandria University with what we call the TAFL, which is teaching Arabic as a foreign language. And every year we receive at least 30 or 35 students from the States. They come to Alexandria, they uh, learn Arabic, we host them in the hustle, we provide them with whatever they need. And on the other hand, they accept some, both students and also some staff to learn and to learn how to teach and learn how to uh, uh, improve his skills. This is a very strong program. We thought of expanding this program, and we agreed on that, that those, we will not bring them to Egypt, not only to, to learn Arabic, but we will use them to teach English. So we'll have a, a mutual benefit. They will help us to teach our students, whether in schools or in the university, to teach them English. 
And we also help them to, teach, to, to, to learn Arabic and to learn the native Arabic and to learn the native uh, languages. We also visited uh, Alabama, University of Birmingham, where we have a joint degree with them and a joint project uh, in, uh, in uh, cancer research. So we have great potentials. Actually, this morning I was in uh, uh, Northwestern University where we had serious discussion about having joint and mutual. What attracts Europeans and uh, the people from North America, actually, to, to Alexandria University is also our strong ties with Africa. Alexandria University is one of the oldest universities that had strong relationship with African countries. We have a branch in Chad, in Jamina. We are teaching them agriculture and veterinary medicine, and hopefully uh, there will be some medical uh, school. We have a, a joint venture with Mo University in Kenya. We have a branch in southern Sudan. It was in, uh, in uh, Tong now. It's a small country called, it's called Tong. It, it was in Joba uh, first, but then when the political changes happened, we were transferred to Tong. We also, I've just visited uh, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, where I had a very interesting meeting with the Addis Ababa University president. We had the Ministry of Health, and they gave us 5,000 uh, meters of land inside Addis Ababa to build a unique branch of Alexandria University that will be both in medicine, especially in women's health, helping them to, uh, to change and improve the habits. And also we have a, a center for African culture and African arts. We discovered actually that uh, the ties between Ethiopia and Egypt are very strong. We are hoping actually to build something like a curriculum of Nile Basin universities. And we will utilize our branch in Addis Ababa to be the focal point among these universities. Not only this, we also have ties with Eastern, uh, Southern Eastern, uh, uh, Asia, we have uh, strong ties with Malaysia, as I mentioned. We have ties with Viet Vietnam. We have ties with China. We have uh, uh, Japan is a strong partner. And in Alexandria, the first Japanese university outside Japan. It's called the Egyptian Japanese University. It's very close to Alexandria University. And fortunately, it's very close to the area we have about 30, 340 faddans, which is slightly more than an acre, uh, dedicated to the university, close to the Japanese university, and close to a big institution uh, that was designed for research, but unfortunately it's not working because they don't have uh, human resources. So our plan is to utilize this to expand horizontally, to make use of this huge human resource that we have, Instead of firing and, uh, and uh, uh, these people losing the jobs, no, we'll keep them, but we will utilize them in our horizontal expansion. We have started already 30 acres for this technological university. We started something with the uh, centers of excellence that will have a joint venture with the Japanese and with this institution. And I think this is the, uh, some of them are long-term plans, some of them are short plans. Our aim is, we, we, we say that we, we excel locally to expand internationally. This is our motto. Excel locally to expand internationally. And I'm sure there are great uh, potentials and great options of cooperation with all the universities and all countries uh, around the world. This would cover the, the academic part. I'm sure it's even more details than I'm, some of you may even be interested in. We will come to the last part, which is the Constitution. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the conditions in Egypt, uh, Egypt now is governed by the uh, Constitution of, uh, that was put in, nine, in uh, 1971 by President, late President Sadat. And there have been some modifications for this. The latest of them was put in 81 by, uh, or 82 by uh, President Mubarak, actually, these changes, the recent changes, gave him so much power uh, over all existing uh, institutions, whether 
the parliament or whether the even the judges he has he, he will be the chief of the army he will be the chief of the uh, law judges he will be the chief of everything he can stay forever they gave him unlimited uh, resources when after the uh, immediately after the revolution when the uh, military council was governing our country they put some constitutional principles or laws the, it's not a true constitution but among this there was a timetable that should start by election then the elected uh, we have two uh, parties we have the uh, the shab and the shura one of the principles or the timetable is that first the election should start first and then the elected people will be responsible for electing the committee that will put the constitution or that will give us the principles of the constitution and hopefully this will happen before the last step which is the presidential election. Of course because of some uh, difficulties, some uh, what happened is that the old regime, the head of the regime is gone, but the whole body is still there. The whole body with all its power, with all its uh, money, with all its, uh, uh, the whole system, actually, they were governing everything. So these people are still there, and they are still exerting their influence, they are still exerting their power. Obviously, they don't like the change because they are the ones that who lose. So there have been many obstacles that are put forward to contradict this timetable and obstacles. One of them actually was how can the elected council choose somebody to put the constitution. As you all know, 80% of the, 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 the principles in the constitution are unanimously agreed upon. There will be no uh, fuss about it and there will be no changes. But the remaining 20% or even less than that are the things that we need to sit, all of us. All of us means that everybody, regardless of the, the majority or the majority of representation in the parliament, everybody should have a saying, should have his own opinion. And by gathering all these opinions, the, then the the professionals, which are the law and the constitutional professors, can formulate these ideas into the new constitution. Personally, I believe that there have been some, let's say, uh, the, the, the people in the parliament didn't have vision enough or expectation of what the other or the reaction of the others will happen. They thought, which I personally disagree, that being elected by the majority of, uh, of the people gives them the right to choose the people who will put the constitution as the way they see it. So the, 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 the choice of the people, of these 100 people who were supposed to put the constitution, Although it follows many rules, and these rules were strict, and these rules were right, but they didn't take into consideration the reaction of the others towards this. When I was asked, I actually I was, I was elected, I was never nominated, I, I didn't nominate myself. They sent me a nomination, and actually I nominated one of the law professors, very famous. Uh, I gave them the name, this name as a representative of Alexandria University. He is, uh, unfortunately, he was not among the 100. I was chosen mainly because I am the president of a university that's an old, that's cosmopolitan, and n not representing my, my, myself because I don't have uh, the... the vision to, to make a constitution of a whole country, but I have a, th a system. Even before the nomination of this, maybe two or three months ago, when I always meet with the deans of the different faculties, we always end our meeting by a pledge to them. Please, whoever finds 
himself capable of or have an idea that can help us in formulating our constitution. It happened also that not only the constitution that we are changing now, we are also changing the law that controls the universities. We call it a law of organizing uh, education and education and institutions. So we are working parallel in these two directions. And actually the university has two committees. One of them is dedicated for having these uh, proposals for changing the law. And another committee, and this committee I started myself after being nominated uh, for the committee of putting the constitution, I gathered all the uh, deans and influential people in the university and I told them, frankly, I was not chosen for being Ibrahim. I was chosen actually being the president of the university which represents all of you. So we formulated a community, actually a committee, that involves all ideas, all parties, all representatives of the societies, including women, young people from the university, people who have uh, ideas, uh, left uh, uh, way of thinking, people who are liberal, people who are religious, people who are Christians, people who are even uh, too liberal for, for an Egyptian way of thinking, who ask for uh, uh, freedom with no limits. And we are uh, doing hearing sessions for all segments of the society. They are doing hearing session for Christian people. They uh, sat with the uh, patriarch or the, the Christian leaders and asked them, what do you think our constitution should be? Many people, when I was uh, chosen among this, they asked me, why you? I mean, you are not uh, professional in law or you're not a professional in uh, constitutional thinking. I told them, no. Actually, we have to differentiate between two things, between the constitution principles and constitution formulation. The formulation of the principles can be done by a very small committee, two or three, who are expert in constitutional law, who can phrase the ideas properly so that they cannot be twisted or misunderstood or misinterpreted. But uh, the main choice of the constitution is actually to have the people themselves, they express their own ideas. I mean, the, the, the constitution, for example, should, my personal, now I'm speaking as uh, Osama Ibrahim, should focus on the human, the human being, regardless of his religion, his age, his gender, his anything, the human. We should respect this human, respect his body, he should not be arrested, he should not be uh, put in jail without any reason. The, the, the emergency law that has been governing us for 30 years, freedom of his soul, he's, I mean, he's, he's free to choose his own religion, he's free to choose his own uh, ideas, he's free to express these ideas. I mean, the, the, there's no oppression. There's, what we call the, 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 the soul itself, God himself, he praised the soul. He, he made the soul of the human more sacred than Kaaba, than the holy uh, building. So we need to represent this principle, this idea, to, to, to emphasize that the human soul and the human body both need to be respected, respected in all ways. And we have to protect these rights. And it's the duty of the, of the law professors and constitution experts to formulate what we think. The, the, why are people, why, what was the objection about this community actually? Everybody thought that uh, certain names, certain figures in Egypt should be represented in the constitution. And I was asked, the first day that we, we met, I was asked by an interview by a journalist about my opinion in this. I told them, we are strange. We are concerned about 
who puts the Constitution? Our main concern should be the reverse. How is the Constitution? What are the principles of the Constitution? And it's not an honor to, 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 that I will be the one who put this. No, it's actually the putting these principles is open to everybody. The, this, this committee, the 100 people, in my opinion, they are not responsible of putting the Constitution by their own. No. Each one of these 100 people has a circle, whether he is a university president, whether he is a farmer, whether he is a worker, if he is a young chap, if she is a lady. Everybody represents a sector of the society, and it is the, his job to bring the ideas of this sector of the society. And the media, actually, the media played a, a very bad role in this, in creating the division and separation among the people. On the contrary, the media, the, the, the role of the media is actually to bring these people. I mean, if they say we have a, a figure that should be included in the uh, Constitution Committee, why don't this figure present his own proposals through the media, have a discussion group, have a, a, a special program where they have uh, ideas. I mean, everybody is invited, regardless of his age or his ethnic or group or his uh, political uh, uh, directions, to put his ideas, to transfer these ideas. And only a small group of professionals can formulate these ideas. We should uh, first agree on the common principles. And it's not a, a difficult job. We know that the, the 71 constitution was made mainly by one person. So if you have 100 person, each one with a circle of at least 100,000 people, I think they will be able to put uh, a new one. Uh, there may be some mistakes in the way it was chosen, or sometimes they, they were not enough preparation or enough uh, uh, counseling with the other parties. But at the end, I believe that whoever is sincere and whoever, who, whoever wants to share, whether by a, an idea, all he needs is to write down his thoughts and send it to the community or the, the committee or even send it to the media to discuss it in public. And I think the, the next change will be this. And I told the people, whether I stay in this Constitution Committee, or I, it's not a personal, it, of course it's an honor, but I mean, if it's not, it, it's not, uh, it's not the honor of just being there. It's a, it's, a, it's a mission. Whether I am inside this committee or outside the committee, the Alexandria University Committee will go on, will continue its proposal, and will carry this proposal to whoever will be in this committee. And I think this will represent the the ideas of all the concerned parties in the university. And I hope so. I think I took more than I should. <laughs> We're still time. Well, uh, uh, it's now your job. It's now uh, uh, my, my, my turn to hear you and maybe answer some of your concerns or questions. And remember, I'm here uh, uh, to represent Alexandria University cosmopolitan, not special direction, not special uh, affiliation. I, am, uh, uh, I always tell, once everybody is in a public position, he should take off all his belongings, all his personal ideas, and represent, really, the people that he should represent. Because for me, I am, we call it the father of all the people in the university, and it's my job to keep the rights and help all of them. Well, I, I think... Is, is the parliament going to choose a new one? Or yes, a, yes. I think there is a debate now whether to choose all of the 100 people. Well, well, the problem is with this, uh, uh, the military council, I mean, why choosing 100? I mean, to put 100 persons in the, uh, in the law is, uh, is a binding uh, uh, 
workforce. So I think they've decided to change the percentage, whether to have them all from outside the parliament, which I personally agree. I mean, people in the parliament have the, enough problems to worry about. They should be devoted to these problems and uh, give the honor or give the mission to others who are willing to do this. Uh, some people, they, I think they will keep 25% from the parliament to make sure that uh, things are going in the right direction. I, I'm not sure the final decision. I think it should be there, not yet. Okay, so it's not settled yet, the proportion. But I believe that even now, we shouldn't wait for this committee. All concerned parties should have their own proposals. They should have, should, they should have uh, we are doing this. We are doing in Alexandria University, hopefully in, in, I wouldn't say in few days, but at least two or three weeks, we will have a final draft for a full constitution that's made by all concerned parties. And this will be a proposal to, the, to be discussed. If it's okay, well and good. If it has some changes, we are, we are not uh, binding the, the committee to do uh, Strange enough, I mean, this is a side talk. When I, when I was in Columbia University, actually, uh, Dr. Uh, Bollinger, the president, he is specialized in human rights and freedom of press. Mm -hmm. And I met uh, two there who are Nobel Prize winners and uh, we discussed together their proposal. I told them I will be more than happy and honored to have your input. You, w whatever you think will be appropriate. And actually one of the good constitutions that will help Egypt is the Iraqi constitution. The Iraqi constitution, uh, uh, and I know that many of the professors in the States here helped the Iraqi people to put this. It, it, it provides also a, a good model of moderation, of, of uh, having different groups of different ethnic uh, directions and how, to, uh, how can we make these people work together and have common principles. We should not exactly copy it, but at least it should be one of our guiding constitutions that should be studied thoroughly. Uh, well, the Iraqi constitution, I think, has both the president and a, a prime minister. Yes. Right, but he was, uh, do you think of uh, the military, uh, I mean, one thing, well, first of all, I guess the military council wants to have the constitution decided before, the, excuse me, the president. But do you think they favor, I mean, they choose another presidential model that person could amass a lot of power again, right? So in an Iraqi system where you had a president and a prime minister, right, maybe there would be more potential diffusion of power. But, uh, yeah, I, I think this is this particular point will be the, the, the point of most discussion and most concerns. We all agree in Egypt that the parliamental model where the parliament has the strong uh, power and the president has less power is the ideal. But it will be a great transition. I, in Egypt, we are still uh, bound by the pharaonic idea of having somebody who holds the whole power in his hands. If he's just and fair, the country will flourish. If he's evil and uh, unjust, the country will go down, unfortunately. This will take a long time to change. That's why my personal opinion is that in this particular point, I think we should have a mixed system, a system that will combine both a parliamental force, the parliament will choose the prime minister, will have his power, but he will be responsible for, and he has the power to change it. And yet the president has to approve it somehow, and has, there has to be some balance. And that's, I think, this is one of the reasons why the Muslim brothers proposed a president from their own, because they wanted some sort of balance between the presidential power and the parliament power. And of course, this, not only the, the military council that doesn't like this, but also some other minority groups are afraid from this. And I think it's the mistrust and the, what they call it, the, 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 yeah, yeah, everybody is not trusting the other. 
everybody thinks that everybody wants to have the power in hands. But I think uh, we should respect each other and give us a chance. Give somebody uh, else a chance. We have been ruled for years by a special uh, group with a special way of thinking, and the end result was not favorable to anybody. Why don't we give uh, another? It, it's almost agreed now that the Islamic way of thinking will be governing the whole area, not only Egypt. So I think it's for the benefit of everybody to give a chance for the modern Islamic way of thinking. Give them a chance, give them a trust, and uh, we define a, a period of time. Let's say in the, the, the Constitution is not a holy book. It's made by man, and it, it, it can change. Why don't we say that in this particular point, if we have a disagreement, we'll have a transitory period. Afterwards, we can reconsider it. We can change it. We can modify it. But let's agree on the 90, 95% of the, of the things that we all agree upon. After the revolution, we all agree on certain principles. I mean, we all agree about the freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of expression, the... the, the uh, the, the fact that we, we should feel that it's our own country. I should not be humiliated in my country, whether physically or mentally or, or spiritually. I should have uh, the, the right to express my own view, and I should also learn to listen to others, listen to the other. I mean, I should respect, respect everybody's opinion because uh, th this is actually God's wisdom of creating people. God tells us in the Holy Quran that he could have had the whole people as one, but that's why he created us. God created us different. This is the, this is the, the, the reason why we are here. We believe that God created us different so that we can learn to live together, and based on this relationship, we will be judged in the day after. So, I think if we all agree to accepting the other, to give him the, the, the absolute freedom, I think Egypt face will change. And not only Egypt, but the whole area and probably the whole world will change. Yes? Without borders. Without you are part of our organization. We like to come to visit Egypt to help and specifically for the agriculture. But still, we are facing a lot of problems. So, if there is any way uh, from your perspective you can help us to avoid these uh, issues, we, uh, we, we, we know that poverty in Egypt is more yeah. than now for years. Yes. Well, I agree 100% with you. Actually, before the revolution, we're, we were expecting an uprise of the poor people. And uh, strangely enough, a friend of mine, actually, who specialized in, uh, in geography and demography, we realized that whether intentionally or unintentionally, the distribution or the demographic distribution in Egypt is made so that each rich community 
is surrounded, unfortunately, by an area of slums of poor people. And if you look, you will be surprised, you will be amazed. It, it cannot be haphazard. It must have been planned, unfortunately. So we were expecting the uprise of the poor people. And we are so lucky that the revolution came in the right time. These people, of course, they, they, they were also pushed by whoever, the third party we call him, to, to make uprises and to, make, uh, to cut the roads and to, to do this. But uh, so far, they are not against the, the, the rich people. We were afraid that the poor people will attack the rich people and consider them responsible for their problem. Fortunately, this didn't happen, and hopefully it will not happen. And I agree with you that everybody, not only Islamic Relief or anything, everybody who loves Egypt, whether he's an Egyptian or an American, or, and I know that there are so many people who love Egypt and who respect Egypt and who believe that Egypt has a role in the area and in the, in the, in the whole world. And I think that we, we all, and I would say we, all have a duty towards our country. And, and this rule can be so small, but too many small rules will make a big rule. Of course, if we can put the way, the scientific way of handling things is the SWAT analysis. We, we see our points of strength. We see our points of weakness. We amplify the points of strength and we acknowledge the points of weakness and try to improve. Of course, the points of weakness include poverty and lack of, of money. And hopefully this will improve because, you know, when our resources were stolen, we were surviving. So hopefully when the good people come, the resources will be ours and we can help use these resources properly. Until this time comes, I think whoever has somebody like you, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert in the regulations and laws and this, but I'm, I told them I'm really willing to break any law that stops the good from doing uh, good things. And, I, and during this, I've been elected for only four months. Now, people who are around me, they know that, unfortunately, to say that the law cannot stop me from doing the right thing. If I believe that this is the right thing, then the law is, the law is not meant to stop uh, things. The law, the, 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 the law professors say that the general rule is yes, and only few things are restricted if they obstruct the good thing. So the law will change. And it will change soon, by the way, because now people are working for the first time with a the system. They have already studied the current condition with a SWAT analysis. They are professionals. They are management consultants. I know of them. They have a big project, okay, called it Anahda. And the, the Anahda project will involve all parts of the society. They have a model for uh, an ideal village, an ideal city, an ideal university, an ideal school. And this model will represent the, the, the most up-to-date way of dealing with this. And we are honored that Alexandria University was chosen to be one model for this Nahda project. We're working with a high rank management consultant that's helping us to reorganize the administrative things. We are uh, uh, rebuilding our strategic. Alexandria University has always been uh, ahead of the other universities. That's true. I'm not, uh, I'm a strong believer of this. We already have a strategic plan that was put in 2005. My mission during the next month, actually, I started already by studying this strategic plan my mission is to sit with the concerned people, which, who are the deans now, and we, uh, we are going to reorganize this, organize the priorities of the strategic plan, what's urgent and important, 
what's urgent but not important, what's important. And so they have it now and we are in the process. So until the time, the right time comes, I'm more than willing, if you can come to me and we discuss it, we also have some expert in, in, in law and as expert in administration that will help us to bypass any obstacles. And this doesn't only apply, it applies for everybody. Sure. First of all, thanks. Thanks so much for coming over here. I'm really honored to have attended this presentation. And being uh, one of the university graduates, university of Alexander graduates, and especially Steve, like now in the staff. So I'm sure. very I'm trying, I will try to limit my questions as much as I can. But, uh, uh, I am really impressed by the least initiatives that you uh, told us about. Is there any way to put this in the, our website? I know that our website is in a very, very poor condition so but far. When did you last visit it? Uh, well, like maybe three, four months ago. Uh, starting January 1st, uh, at least the appearance of the website has changed a lot. But the website is always uh, a two-way, it's a communication, okay? Uh, we need your input. There is a website and there is contact us, send us your input, send us your criticism, send us your, we, we are improving it. One of the big weaknesses in Alexandria University is that we, we, we are not confined to a one campus. Alexandria University is divided throughout the city. We have the uh, medical, bil medical campus, which includes faculty of medicine, faculty of dentistry, and faculty of pharmacy. We have the uh, humanities campus, which includes the law, the commerce, and faculty of arts, faculty of tourism. And then we have the, uh, ag uh, the engineering, of course, uh, engineering, faculty of engineering, and beside it, slightly away from it, the agriculture and the faculty of science. So the problem of communication is not that easy. We spend a lot of money building cables for, uh, for uh, internet and uh, uh, IT, and, but we find it really this is one of the aspects that you can help us with your expertise and with your help. We are trying to rebuild our IT department and our IT concepts. We want to have, and so up until now, so uh, I am a member of many societies. All the societies, we have an intranet. We have a, a forum. We have a, a group where we discuss our problems and we share our ideas. So far, in Alexandria University, we have not built a forum that would allow me as a president to communicate at least with the deans and give them an instant and get an instant response. So I promise you that within the, I wouldn't say a few months, but at least within the next year, the, the interface of Alexander University, not only the, the website, will change a lot. We will communicate, we will use less papers, more... Uh, one of the things that... It's the, about time to mention it now. Uh, I'm not an administrative person. I'm not clever at, uh, you know... Uh, writing and signing. And unfortunately, the, uh, uh, when I proposed to this position, I thought that administration will take only 20% of my time and management will take 40% of my time. And leadership, this is, this is where I find my main role. Uh, leadership should be my main mission. I mean, everybody can sign the leaves and sick leaves and promotions and the, of the, this takes 80% of my time so far. I have to sign for every check. I have to sign for every, uh, you know, uh, you will believe it, every uh, chair that's bought in the university, every oven, <laughs> everything. So I, I'm, I'm taking it lightly, but this has to change. I mean, hopefully within one year, with proper delegation, I've started to delegate many of these missions now, Unfortunately, the law doesn't allow me. I mean, nobody can sign a check except the president. So, believe it or not, all checks that go into the university has to be signed by the president. So, we will we, we'll change it. We, are, we, we know our weakness. This is very important. And this is encouraging me. We already 
defined all the weak spots and all the weak uh, parts in the university, and this is the first step to improve it and then to build upon it. spirit of what you're really sharing with all of us here is the spirit that I personally found when I visited Egypt in January at the anniversary. I grew up in Egypt. Uh, it's been the first third year of my life. I've been living here in the States for about 25 years. Which and makes me all my age. <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, uh, January, I went to Egypt for the first time. But uh, in spite of the fact that in the media, especially here in the States sometimes, mm -hmm. We portray what's happening in Egypt uh, as sometimes scary, sometimes chaotic, a lot of conflict. Uh, nobody knows who's doing what. And of course, because of their demonstration and some unpleasant events or circumstances that happened to the school and so forth. When I came back and I shared my experience with everybody, everybody was surprised because I was so positive and so hopeful. And I think what was remarkable about Egypt is this explosion of decentralization, no control, everybody feels entitled and empowered to voice an opinion that sometimes appears, even to the Egyptians sometimes, even my family, some of my family members sometimes feel a little bit demoralized that everybody is protesting, everybody has an opinion, and I'm trying to explain to them that all of a sudden, the 85 million people feel empowered to express their opinion and their voice counts. And there is a group of people who will go outside. Teachers will, in front of the government, uh, they, they come talking about they wanted whatever, looking at their benefits. Uh, paramedics, one time, were striking because they wanted to have permanent contract or being have jobs because they were in contract. A lot of things that not even people were aware of, that all of a sudden, everybody is voicing an opinion and is participating in this process of democracy and decentralization. And I'm not surprised that being a president of the university, because everything was centralized, that you have to sign every check, yes. you have to approve every chair to be repaired or replaced. Or, and, and, but that's what you're sharing with us, that now everybody is willing and open and receptive to change, which I think yes. was the biggest problem before that. Nobody wanted to change, and now we understand that there is a culture of no change, culture of keep things the same way that was yes. promoted as culture of stability. And we under now we understand that there was no stability whatsoever. Absolutely. Just, uh, just an earthquake was ready to happen. So, but this is going to be the st you know, stability coming from the decentralization. Every institution takes charge of their own affairs, and every little group will participate in one of this. Now, I, I want my question for you is, is this happening only at the Center University or is it happening in other universities as well? Yes. Well, first, I thank you for your comment, and I missed something very important of my vision and mission and strategic plan, which is autonomy. Amazingly enough, Alexandria University has signed the Magna Carta uh, agreement, which is based mainly on the autonomy of universities, and uh, I, I wish I had the, my, my program actually, and I said there is no improvement without autonomy, because if you, if you want, and there is no autonomy without having your own financial support and financial uh, resources. To answer your question, yes, this is happening in almost everywhere. And we meet, the university presidents, we meet almost uh, at least once a month. We all have the same problems. We all have the same inspirations. Some more than others. Some have less problems. Alexandria University, being a huge university, has huge problems. And also, the, 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 the hopes are higher. Because once we, we, we have things at hand and we have our uh, control, things will definitely be uh, much better. Speaking of our own autonomy, my first meeting with the uh, Minister of, education, of Higher Education, which is my superior, I spoke about autonomy. I said, we're here, we are not appointed by you, 
He was supposed to be the man who appoints the, the we are not, we respect you, but we are not appointed by you. We are chosen by the professors and colleagues and our power comes from them. And not only this, but we are responsible in front of them. I mean, if we don't do what we promised, I mean, we have been elected based on a plan and a agenda and a strategic plan and vision. And my main was this autonomy. His reply was, was real, but I mean, it was shocking to me. He said, don't speak about autonomy unless you have your own financial support. Once you get money from the Ministry of Health, you should abide to our law. I came back, I proposed to have a trust of Alexandria University. And hopefully it took us three months to have the approval and the legal approval. And finally, only last week, we got the approval of having our own trust. The, 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 the trust represents my hope of doing all the things that I'm dreaming of. Because this is the only way to achieve something without having the approval. Because amazingly, uh, not only that I'm, uh, I have to sign each check, but I also have to get the approval of everything from the minister. And the minister has to get the approval from the prime minister. The prime minister has to get the approval from the president. So the only way is to have our own financial support. And I have great hopes in this trust. It's, it will be open to everybody and it will be declared exactly. And this is one of the, the, the new era. Alexandria University is a value-based university. It's based on, the, the first one is, we call it chefafia, which is clarity. I mean, everything is open. Everything is, is subject to, to, to revision. Everybody who wants any data is more than welcome to have it. Everything that comes in and comes out is open. And this waqf or trust will have its own board and it will be directed mainly to two things. Research, providing the tools for research and uh, support for the young chaps to travel abroad, to uh, get joint degrees, to get uh, training, to get workshops. It will be mainly, this is the main job. And the second will be in the construction plans because in many instances, we are abide by, by the laws that prevents us even from doing any construction. If we want to, to build a, a, even a small building, I have to go through processes that might take three to six months. Unless I have the money, if I have the money, I have the right to appoint this or delegate this to, in, in one day to a special group. So we are working to help our, our, to, to have our own resources. Everybody is welcome. We, are, we will start a fundraising program. We will start an alumni meeting by the end of this year, around Christmas time. We'll invite all the graduates of Alexandria University in all subspecialties. We, we, we are thinking of having a, a, a new theme to this conference. Being a, a medical, I can't escape my, my medical background, so we'll, we'll give it a name. Health, the daughter of all sciences. We know that philosophy is the mother of all sciences, but health, not medicine, is, you know, uh, it's related to all disciplines. We have, health is related to agriculture, health is related to engineering, is related to faculty of science, commerce, the environment, the salination, the energy. So health will be our focus because it will combine most of the disciplines and we will bring people, we are hoping to bring at least 500 uh, graduate alumni and every one of these 500 alumni will have a mission. He, through his community, he will have to help Egypt by whatever. We, we don't need money actually. Money is the last thing that we should worry about. We need your expertise, we need your knowledge, we need your uh, support. If everybody, if uh, everyone of these 500 will be responsible for one young uh, uh, staff, it will help him, will support him, maybe invite him 
in his subspecialty, take care of him. This will be a basis that will, uh, this one will be a messenger actually, a messenger for Alexandria University. And when we, he will come back and he has to come back, he will help us to build our university. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm 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 sorry I took long time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.